Let's set the scene. The year is 2005. E3 is well underway and journalists and industry insiders have gathered into a room for a behind closed door demo. Microsoft is still trying to decide whether or not to include expanded memory in their upcoming Xbox 360. Epic Games' Tim Sweeney insists it's crucial so that the game everyone's about to see can be played in full 720p HD. The screen goes live, the game has no name, and boom. Gears of War will be 13 years old as of the time of this writing in 2019, and while we're staring down the barrel of the series' sixth release, there's something special about that first entry. This was a game that single-handedly reshaped the image of the Xbox, known as a Halo machine, and turned it into the home of the shooter. It stood in stark juxtaposition to what Sony was offering with its Indiana Jones simulator in Uncharted. Maybe most importantly, it mastered a subgenre that it would in turn redefine. Maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's the bombastic allure of Cliffy B, but to this day, nothing has graced my TV screen during the last generation that has stuck with me as consistently as the first Gears. But so many games are products of their release environments, products of hype, buoyed by circumstance instead of quality. Remember this game? I enjoyed The Force Unleashed 2 a lot when I was younger. It got a lot of attention. Today, well, not so much. So, I decided to sit back down and play back through the original Gears of War experience, once on hard to put its gameplay to the test and again on casual to catch anything I missed. So the question is, is Gears of War as awesome as I remember? I've been doing this a lot recently, this thing where I'm super excited to go back and play an older game or an older franchise and I sit down and almost an hour in every time I think to myself, why did I like this? What, what about this that I find so appealing? And it's happening a lot more. And so I'm starting to go back through the games that I thought were so profound, so great, and really dive deep into them. Literally going from stage to stage or act to act in this case to see what about these games were so great and in some cases so awful. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Gears of War act by act. We're going to look at its sound, its story, its cinematics, everything you could think of about Gears of War we're going to dive into today. I will be putting timestamps in the description, so if you want to skip ahead to Act 2 or 3 or music or whatever it is, you can do that. That'll be in the description. So, yeah, there's that. So, to get started, I think we should start with a bit of context as to how Gears of War was developed, because it wasn't necessarily traditional. From the get-go, I've wanted to make a game that has horror elements in it, as well as military themes, right? And... Uh, we're not doing as good as we could. The multiplayer of Gears of War was an afterthought, so much so that 90% of the game's development cycle was spent on the game's campaign. That's right, the game's multiplayer was tacked on at the last minute. This should tell you just how strange the development of this game really was. Originally, Epic wanted to create a new release in the Unreal Tournament series. They were creating a game called Unreal Warfare. It was a large, multiplayer-focused game set in the same universe as Unreal. But after development complications and a delay, they shifted gears to Gears of War. This game was even stranger. It was a mech-based combat game that focused heavily on player power balance. Throughout this phase of development, Gears was also set to be built as a first-person shooter that had little to no cover elements, until finally a refinement happened and gang director Cliffy B, or Cliff Bozinski as he's normally known, got inspired. He wanted to create a game reminiscent of Resident Evil 4, horror elements and all, and in pursuit of that slower paced gameplay, the third person cover shooter that is now Gears began to coalesce. Gears of War would cost $10 million to develop. At the time, it was a big investment for Epic, one that appears risky on the surface, but the game would be more than successful enough to justify the cost with 2020 hindsight, bringing in over $100 million in pure revenue, ballooning the studio's financial estimates, and it sold. In a single day, it became the most played Xbox Live game up to that time, eventually settling in as one of the top three games played on the system by the end of that gen, and it sold a million copies in its first week alone before eventually passing well over six million copies by the end of 09. There was something special, something so immediately evident about the game that it lived so many different development lives. And it becomes clear the second you start playing it. Gears of War starts in Meteor Res, smack dab in the middle of a war on the planet Sarah. One of the defining development rules for the game 
was that Cliffy B didn't want aliens from space. It was too generic. So the Locust Swarm is a threat that comes from within the planet's vortex. After a 79-year war amongst humanity over a natural resource known as emulsion, the Locust hit the planet's surface to take over. All that's left of human government is the cog and its shoulders, the gears. They were tossed into the shoes of Marcus Phoenix, who's been sitting in a prison cell for what the game insinuates was treason or some kind of traitor-esque betrayal. But we'll come around back to that. Mostly because Gears was developed as a gameplay first project, and it shows. The tutorial is essentially optional, a design decision far more games should employ. You could choose to go the hand-holding route or hop right into combat. The beauty of both is that the game doesn't waste time. You're right into the action either way and both give you the opportunity to learn, albeit at a mildly different pace. Your job in Act 1 is to find and support Alpha Squad, but as a new player, you'll be more focused on helping yourself. Act 1 is where Gears of War immediately caught my attention once again. There is very little in this game that revolutionizes the industry, the medium, and its innovations are often more popularizations, but it's actually the game's strength. As you make your way through these first few Locust Hordes, you realize that unlike so many games that struggle with giving you control, your deaths and gears are your fault and your fault only. This is a perfection of third-person shooting. There's a meticulous balance between the weight the game creates with slower character movement and the precision with which the cover system works. Snapping to cover after a roadie run is seamless. Holding A gets you exactly where you want to be, or at least close enough. Combat rules break up movement to allow for more freedom, but you've seen most of this before 2005. Here, everything is just refined. For example, in this first act, you're taught how to operate the chainsaw on the bottom of the lancer, which when used properly, creates this. This looks overpowered, so Epic, instead of just allowing you to hold B and abuse the lancer, as well as trivialize the challenges of the game, imbued it with some strategy. The chain takes a second or two to actually start, and if you're shot while it's revving, you will stop. Starting the chain will also take you out of cover. This means that rushing in and slicing everything within a yard of you becomes near impossible, and baiting your enemies to you is a risk that exposes you, so that gory reward becomes a treat you only see ever so often. In the early game it's easier, after taking out a few locust grunts and probably dying once or twice, you run across the entirety of Delta Squad. The smartest thing the game's plot does begins here. Mystery. Marcus is reinstated as a gear, but you still don't know why he was in prison to begin with. You don't understand Phoenix's history with a squad. You don't even know why he's fighting. All you know at this point is you need to find the resonator, which will map the Locust underground tunnels and allow the gears to detonate explosives within them. That's it. For now, this aura of mystery around its characters is a strength. This is also where the tutorial essentially ends, and you're exposed to some of the brilliance of the game's third-person shooter refinements outside of these cutscenes. Gears can be brutal on higher difficulties, but as you search for the resonator, you're introduced to layered level design that gives you the agency to create your own approach, and even in some ways, your own difficulty. Look, I adore Uncharted, but I constantly feel like a fish in a barrel. No matter where I go, what I do, every combat encounter usually comes down to running for my life, guns blazing, until no one but Nate is breathing. What's obvious in this first act is by intentionally choosing a more methodical pace of gameplay, Epic was afforded more freedom in how they designed cover and levels. Here, for example, you have two options. You can take on these locusts by bouncing cover to cover head on by going this way, or sneak off of the combat roll to the right in an attempt to flank the turret commander and get a leg up. And while this is a particularly simple choice, as you progress through the stage, you're introduced to cover placements like these that make flanking almost as dangerous as trying to time a body shot on the grunt behind the chain gun. This kind of level design player agency extends to a few rather arbitrary choices sprinkled throughout the game that lead to fairly awesome set pieces every now and again. These are not as organic as the flank or go straight routes. Whereas most levels are structured with free-flowing player choice within the linearity of the levels themselves, Act 1 starts to present you with the option of left path or right path. Here, neither offer anything dramatically different from a gameplay perspective, but the hallway sequence if you choose the right path is really great and an example of why this probably was implemented. The game gave you just enough grenades in the sequence before this, four, to seal four emergence holes, but now you're likely out, and are forced to stare down a chain gun without them, and you can see your squad mates on the other path fighting as you attempt to protect them, and vice versa through windows and holes in the wall. By waiting until the turret is focused on them, you can, and should, be quick enough to roadie run into a position that allows you to take these grubs out. So many modern shooters to this day struggle to make your squad mates feel alive, like valuable parts of the narrative you're engaging in. 
Halo 5, for example, struggle mightily with this, but these moments attach you to your squad, make you feel like that's exactly what you are, and creates a partnership, one that advances these kinds of set pieces in meaningful ways. And this extends through Act 1. After being introduced to the absolutely brutal Nasher shotgun, you'll find and save Cole or Coltrane. Instead of a massive cutscene providing an exposition dump on the character and who he is, the game just keeps rolling, dumping the exposition in the in-game dialogue that keeps you in the action while still informing you of Cole's past as a pro athlete and introducing you to his personality. We saw you play. That's right, everybody wants to see the train, baby. Hey Marcus, remember? Division playoffs, 40 yard line. I remember you owe me 20 bucks. This, again, is a strength of that gameplay first mantra. Probably also due to the fact that the game's cinematics were kind of a struggle, but we'll get there, but it does explain why there are so few. And from here, we begin to see the gameplay open up in terms of what it throws at you. Enemy variety isn't groundbreaking in Gears, but these guys, these are terrifying, and also a treat when you first meet them. This segment was likely designed to reward players that have picked up a Nasher earlier in the act, as the shotgun makes this segment a splatterfest in the hallway your Coliseum. An attempt, no doubt, to get reliant players to start switching between their tools instead of just using the Lancer, which is not quite the best tool for this job. And you'll have to switch again, because from there, it's Hammer of Dawn time. This is a limited use tool, meaning the game designs an entire segment or segments around it usually a very particular gameplay mechanic, and then moves on past it, only to reintroduce it again for set-piece moments. Gears explains the Hammer of Dawn away by telling you it only works when the satellites are in position and when you're out in the open. A little too on the nose? Yep. Does it matter? Nope. The Hammer makes you feel like a god. It's a weapon that asks you to take aim at something for long enough for a targeting system to triangulate, and then rains down a funnel of flames for just long enough to kill, well, almost anything. And the game immediately gives you this playground to do just that. This small enclosure is filled with a cedar and dozens of grunts, all there for you to burn alive. Most locusts explode in an organy mess when struck by the hammer while you're tasked with taking out the cedars, as your primary goal. When the game first released, some reviewers complained about this section of the game, stating that it felt too simplistic and eased up the game's difficulty. They had to be playing on casual. Even on Hardcore, this section is a slick set of well-designed set pieces that proffer a primary target, the Cedar, that takes time to bring down, and secondary enemies that make that task much more difficult. In my opinion, this portion of Act 1 is excellent, so it's fitting that the Act wraps up with a test of not just the Hammer, which is defined the Act's set pieces, but a test of the entirety of the game's mechanics and systems. The Berserker you meet here is awesome. Her first kill is off-camera, showing only a shadow that heightens the tension and perpetuates a fear of what she can really do. As far as boss fights go, she's not particularly inventive, but once again, as though it was Gear's MO, she's just fun. She can smell you if you're too close, hear you if you fire or move, but can't see you or what's in front of her. You need to bait her into rushing clearly defined walls and opening up holes for you in them. Firing rounds into her will anger her, but roll out too soon and she'll miss your mark. It's a well-designed game of chicken that opens up into a test of well, how well can you aim and move to take her down with a hammer? It's short, it's sweet, and it's challenging, just challenging enough to be memorable. As for Act 1's story beats, it comes to a close better than maybe any chapter of a good book could, and better than any chapter of this game. We're introduced to Locust Leader General Ram, in what to this day is one of the most intense villain introductions I have ever seen in a game. This cutscene is unbelievably well done. We watch as Ram executes squad leader Kim and Phoenix and his squad flee to safe ground. The act ends with Marcus taking control of Delta, being thrust into a position of uncertain leadership after having just been rescued from prison for betraying the cult. And in one cutscene, our hero and villain's roles are established. While the unwilling hero role is indeed cliche, the impact of how the story gets you there thus far and the unknown surrounding the squad keep you engaged heading into Act 2. Act 2 is Gears of War epic Cliffy B saying, alright, time to make this really dark, and trust me, they do that literally and figuratively. Act 2 is where the game starts to ramp up both its difficulty and its mechanical complexities. Making your way through Nightfall while being hunted by a threat you can only catch glimpses of is awesome. Then the first third of Act 2 being hunted by a large, what you see as a spider-looking enemy, while being accosted from all sides 
by grubs. That's okay, because by now, the game is smartly ready to hand you the rest of what you need. At this point, you've probably grown accustomed to a feature that Gears not only popularized, but was one of the first big AAA releases to ever really implement. How do you make the arbitrary act of reloading interesting and meaningful? Reloading is a bit of a minigame here, referred to as active reload. By pressing reload, you start a QTE. Time it in the smallest white section and hit it again, and you get a perfect reload, which gets you right back into the action and is essentially a free reload. That also increases the damage per shot of your next couple rounds by as much as 8%. Land it in the gray bar, and you've got yourself a 1.8 second reload time. But fail, and your gun will jam, leaving you defenseless for as many as 5 seconds. Why does this matter? Simple. Take the Lancer. A perfect reload is that aforementioned one second. A regular reload is three seconds and a failed is over four. That's a dramatic difference. And every gun in the game has different numbers associated with it. Screw up a reload while a bunch of wretches are chasing you and it's basically over. It's a great system that differentiates the weapons, but also keeps you constantly engaged in what is a bit of a skill curve. It's here where the game also gives you its throwaway mechanic, the ability to give your squad orders. To do so, you hold left bumper and A for attack, B to stop, and Y to regroup. You will rarely, if ever, need this or use it, especially on hardcore or casual, but hey, it's there. And as you make your way through Act 2, mastering these tools, eventually, you'll hit a stranded settlement. This is here to provide perspective. Up until now, you've seen next to no human life outside of the squad. The fight has already felt lost. The settlement, however, makes the world finally feel lived in. Makes you feel like there's something left to fight for, someone left to fight for. It's a great piece of world building that fleshes out the civilization you represent as a gear. Civvies will call you a pig and paint you as the enemies as you walk through, a direct parallel to the cultural perception of police in parts of the US. People recognize coal from Thrashball. It reminds you that there's still life here, and there was life before the emergence. It's great storytelling. You made Franklin, who owes Santiago or Dom a favor for some reason, and get him to let you borrow his ride. And that's what you go off hunting for. At this point, the game will once again split Delta up, with you and Dom doing your own thing and Baird and Cole off on theirs. At this point, this appears to be an effort to make the gameplay feel a bit more tense, stacking the odds against two of you instead of four, ensuring you don't become too reliant on three extra helping hands. As you make your way to the car, at least in my experience, with a handle on the mechanics now, you start to realize how intentionally clunky gameplay really is. Cliffy B wanted to make sure that Gears was a bit obtuse when it came to how it handled. He wanted to make sure that you were playing a scary, high-tension experience. It's part of the reason that they went with the kind of shaky cam handheld feeling when moving a roadie running. Another way he said he wanted to manage this was by removing the reticle, ensuring you only see one when you aim down sights, and even then, the hitbox can be abnormally large depending on the weapon. This was to make you feel a bit out of control, a bit less like a human tank, and to make the game more visceral. It's the same reason you can tag an enemy with a nade if you take the risk and melee them while it's equipped. And again, as already mentioned, why there's a lot of camera movement while walking faster roadie running, a natural head bobbing occurs to make that movement feel more organic and weighty. But through all of this, eventually you'll make your way to what looks like a riverboat. This is a great sequence in Act 2 that almost feels built entirely for co-op. Marcus steers the boat as it drags along while Dom handles the enemies on the bridge. Every few seconds you have to weigh whether or not you're being overwhelmed and need to stop steering or keep pushing through. This is how you make mundane tasks and games a tad more interesting. Take a QTE that should be simple and add a bit of spice. Around this time, heavy enemies begin being tossed your way in the form of brutes carrying boomers, which are essentially nade launchers, so the fear here is real. Once off the boat platform, you hit a checkpoint. And for me, this is where the game starts to turn into something special. As you walk up to the checkpoint, you see two guys standing under a light. They tell you not to step in the darkness, and boom. These are the Krill. Epic smartly introduced them with this awesome moment because it serves two purposes. One, from a design perspective, they could have paused the action and explained the Krill with a pop-up screen like a lot of games do, but instead of breaking the gameplay up, this prevents that reality. And two, because of how well the scene is set up, you immediately understand exactly what the game needs you to. Stay in the light or die. Great use of visual language. This is where you see the team's decision to create slow, methodic gameplay really come to life. Shooting from pain takes to create light to stay alive does a great job of furthering the horror element that the game was originally being built around. As you run from light to light, you can hear the wings and cries of the krill getting closer, creating urgency and risk-reward 
to get ammo or get the dog tags. Better yet, by baiting out locusts, you can easily watch the krill do your work for you. But this is an intense set of sequences, and as well-paced games do, eventually it gives you a rest. You'll use a floodlight to guide Dom through krill, which does just that. Breaks up the tension and provides the player a reprieve. It's not hard, it's not even necessarily enjoyable, it's just kind of there. The same, however, cannot be said for what comes after. You reach this guy, who controls the lights in a set of houses you need to make your way through. The house is pure Saw 4. Disheveled, flickering lights, and a guy who keeps screwing with you over the comms by cutting the lights off on you, which, if you're not quick enough, will sick the krill on you. And this is where I began to really notice the voice acting. Up to this point, the story is a bit shallow, but the voice acting is pure 80s action film. It's all great, it's over the top, Whole Train in particular, but it's the cutscenes that I think are worth talking about. When Gears of War was being developed, the studio had no cinematic team. They wanted all cinematics to be in-engine, but this became difficult, especially because they wanted to use real cinema techniques. So with just three months, that's it, three months to get the job done, they hired a single cinematic director to essentially do the entire job. A cinematic production doc for what seems to be Gears 3 goes into detail with what went right and wrong. The cutscenes here range from awesome to why is this even here, and there's a reason for that. Take this scene here from Act 2. With just three months to get the job done, they had to improvise. All mocap actors were developers on the team, they wanted 30 minutes of cinematics but with so little time, they couldn't even storyboard them first, they had to wing it. So they extended the handheld cam feel of the gameplay, the head bobbing camera movement, to the cinematics. They wanted to create a visceral, in the trenches style documentary feel. And thus, they wanted no talking heads, every scene had to have character movement. This was a lot to handle in such a short period of time, and it led to some scenes, including maybe this one, to become what Epic called Franken scenes where the whole scene would be created in post with no time to do more mocap, simply by patching together existing animations. So while most of them are great, some not so much. But after this particular one, you hit burnt rubber. This is probably here to add some gameplay variety. You whip your way through what is essentially an on-rail section. You're in full control of the car, but it's as simple as a drive-forward simulator in that regard. Instead, the intrigue is in the UV turret, which you have to continuously switch to to finally burn up and destroy some krill as they fly in flocks to attack the car. It can be frustrating on higher difficulties to say the least, but it's a fun new idea that manages to avoid sticking around long enough to overstay its welcome. And from there, you go back and help the rest of Delta survive a locust attack against the settlement before driving off, having your vehicle shot, and immobilized. It's here where you head into the halfway point of the game, Act 3. Most of Gears had gone by so fast at this point, I had enjoyed Act 1 and 2 so much that by the time I got to 3, I was actually a bit surprised to actually check and make sure where I was at to see that I was halfway through. Gears of War 1's real noticeable flaw is that at times it struggles with its identity. Is it a horror game, an action cover shooter, a visceral chainsaw simulator? Parts of Gears play like the game was originally intended to be nothing but horror. The Factory is one of those sequences. The Factory is horror 100%. It's pouring rain outside. You make it indoors after finding an elevator, and you're greeted with a dark, abandoned, barely lit fright fest. This is where Gears' environment building and environmental storytelling really shine. The first half of your way through the Factory is a walking simulator in which you slowly piece together the massacre that occurred there. You'll stumble upon this guy who was killed by something that made its way up the wall and back into the vents, these guys who have been totally violated, and quickly a picture is painted of an infestation that you, the player, should want no part of. Perfect example of showing, not telling. It's also sound that builds attention in the factory. Most of the music stops here and you're left with near silence. You notice too, because Gears score is phenomenal. Destroyed Beauty was the theme that Gears dev team used to inspire the environments of the game. Those two words also inspired Kevin Ripple's score. It's maybe not so hard to believe, but Gears was almost made up of a mostly heavy hitting rap soundtrack. Somewhere along the way, this was lost, and instead, Gears is scored using a mixture of orchestral sounds and in-your-face mixed instrument samples. Metal samples, re-engineered explosive sounds, percussive bangs, electric guitars, it fits the gritty, harsh tone of the rest of the game. And the point is, it's not only great, but it's hard to miss. So the silence of the factory is deafening. When you finally realize that the infestation is exploding glow-in-the-dark wretches that have completely taken over the factory, well, you don't like the silence so much. You make your way through the factory, taking out a few regular locusts and the wretches, but I think this segment shows how much care went into this level. Here, 
A big ammo crate glows through a window, obviously calling your name, as ammo can be limited. It's down an optional path. Picking it up triggers a glowing wretch to pop out of the window behind you for a jump scare. That got me on both playthroughs. Don't grab the ammo and pass the program line, no scare. An entirely missable moment that for me stands out as one of my favorites in the entire game. But that moment is also offset by an incredibly annoying section where you rock across wood over pits of wretches, hoping not to fall with, as far as I can tell, no way to tell which planks will break outside of trial and error, which sucks. Because when you fall, it's right into that pit of wretches where you run for your life to get back to the ladder. And it happens over and over. You'll continue to move your way through the factory to get underground to make use of the resonator to map the locust tunnels until you hit the minecars, which is going to be the conduit for you to get there. The minecar section is a twisted play on old 2D platformer sections. Things like this that you'd find in a Donkey Kong game. It plays out like a horror roller coaster, throwing enemies at you almost in an on rails fashion. It's more spectacle than fun, but it's still awesome. And once again, Epic nailed the balance of set piece ideas, not sticking around too long. And then from there, it's into the belly of the mines. Early in the mines, a choice splits Marcus and Dom up, isolating you for one of the only times in the game, which could have been cool, except it's once again an inconsequential decision, seemingly placed entirely to keep that cooperative feel without breaking pace. But I can't help but wonder whether or not some of these choices were only there because they seemed like they'd make for a good back-of-the-box selling price. Choose your own path, pick your destiny, that kind of thing. You do, however, during this time, start to catch a big glimpse of the fight the game's been teasing since Act 1, a corpser. And your goal now is to make your way to the showdown. The corpser is a tug-of-war style fight in which the game doesn't allow you to flank him. Attempting to do so sees you bounce back by his screen. So you're left having to avoid wretches and claw attacks while attacking its belly before shooting its head as it rears back, forcing it onto the platform behind him as you keep pushing forward, before taking out the clamps by baiting it into stomping them. I think if you're going to do a boss fight on this scale, this is a fairly good way to do it. There's no QTEs, everything is in action, he's huge, but manageable. The fight shows you your progress as he organically retreats, instead of breaking the fourth wall and showing you a health bar. I really like the corpse fight. The mine itself, after he falls into a lake of it, is filled with emulsion. The natural resource humans fought over to begin their 70 plus year war before emergence day. You'll grab the torque bow, an awesome crossbow that obliterates enemies with explosive tips that stays balanced due to the fact that arrows will bounce off of helmets or certain armor so you have to be careful where you shoot it with its limited ammo, and move forward to find the dudes carrying these things are Theron guards. Tough, new armored enemies introduced here that use those torque bows and are much harder to bring down than regular grubs, much more aggressive, and a lot more health riddled. After making your way through a few of these, the act ends with you finally deploying the resonator and seeing it begin to function as intended, blowing what looks like an EMP all the way through the mine. You leap out, exiting into a sunny, colorful green area as if to give the player some hope. Out of the darkness, into the light, literally. A respite from the terror. A great aesthetic choice. Even the guys lie down for a moment to relax. One of the few moments of almost joy Delta shares. Some games forget these kind of things. They forget to take a break from the dark, the horror, they forget color. Moments like the draft moment in Last of Us. And this, in Gears, should be commended for understanding good pacing and understanding how not to fatigue the player. But the resonator didn't work because the tunnels were far bigger than anticipated. However, Baird found files that maps the tunnels instead. The data stream to complete them came from Marcus's father's house. So that's where Delta's headed next. We get a short peek of General Ram again, and then it's off. Back to flaming civilization to get back to Marcus's home. Act 4. I love everything about Act 4, and that's mostly because Epic managed to do something in Act 4 that I think a lot of developers forget is kind of necessary, so let me talk about some of those things. At the jump of Act 4, you land back at East Barricade Academy, which is essentially a giant university, in a courtyard more specifically. A statue acts as a centerpiece. It says hope with a gear cog as the O. An ironic bit of aesthetic given how little hope there really is at this point. There's some irony here that Hoffman, the man who's been commanding you this entire time, the man that sent Marcus to prison, the man who left him there for dead while the locust horde ravaged planets, that's the guy sending Marcus back to his deceased 
father's estate. The campus is an amazing level in terms of aesthetic design. The architecture is awesome. It's gothic. It feels very much like a historic university. You open up to that well-designed courtyard with enemies coming in from all sides, forcing you to dart from cover to cover and reposition, making excellent use of the cover system, and it makes for an intense firefight to test all of the skills you've gained thus far. You'll face heavy, they're on guards, wretches. It's one of the most well-designed pieces of combat-based level design in the entire game. Soon, you all split up again. This time you split up with Baird if you choose the street. Again, a chance for you to spend some time bantering with a different squad mate. You'll quickly get your hands back on the Hammer of Dawn for some carnage against their on guards. But talk about things that are overlooked in games. Here the game tells you through a voice line from Anya over comms that the hammer is offline. This is important. It allows you to drop it for more practical weapons and not carry around a waste of an inventory slot. So you have some fun with the hammer and move on. It's hard not to notice, again, that campus is a much needed break from the darkness. It quite literally feels refreshing. The sun, the foliage, it's almost a reward for making it through the depression-fueled horror of the last two acts. And I think this particular act does an excellent job of preventing fatigue that I've already mentioned with that darkness. It's here where you hit another berserker, but this one has to be snuck around and let out of the enclosure so you can hit it with the hammer. This time, you bait her into the light or into pillars to use the hammer in the sunspots. It's a much cooler berserker fight than the first and much harder, seems as it's much more difficult to keep her in range of the hammer in the sun. And her cries are scary. So let's go back to that sound design. One thing Gears does phenomenally is sound design from an enemy perspective. You can hear their on guards hissing, the screams of exploding wretches, the yells of heavies. The sound design is so distinct and well done that it can and should be used as a literal threat identifier by the player, which is in full display in this act. Like here, where the first thing you hear is the gunner. This is nice vertical level design, with the gunner on top as well as under the bridge, and puts that sound design on full display. Around this time is when you're asked to go to the actual Phoenix estate, on this ridiculous campus that you realize that Marcus's family and father were rich and highly regarded. But we'll get back to that. Fighting up the stairs to the estate is awesome as you grind your way up, mostly because the two lane set piece design allows you to feel like every push is a risk. Also, a torque arrow to this guy's face is great. Once inside, the estate and the wine cellars beneath force you to switch between two types of combat, ranged and CQC. The house's two stories offer verticality that keep you uncomfortable and keep you fighting from a distance, while the cellar below juxtaposes that with tight, claustrophobic hallways and gameplay. Make your way into the secret lab, pull the data for all the locust tunnels, protect the house while Jack downloads data, and engage with these two styles of combat just long enough for a cutscene to introduce you to a massive rocket shooting threat, a broom act, as you escape in the APC, awing at how absolutely insane this thing is in terms of scale. And then, it's on to the final act. Before we jump into Act 5, I do want to point something out. I had completely forgotten how Gears ended. It had been years since I played the game, and for some reason, I thought things went a lot differently than the sequence I'm about to describe. I don't know if that's because I confused a couple games, but I guess we'll kind of see as I go through this. Here's what we know starting Act 5. The bomb sits on a train headed to an emulsion sinkhole. Delta's goal is to rendezvous with the train to end this war once and for all. The Locusts somehow figure out what Delta's doing and raise a drawbridge to halt their progress. Right away you get some info about Marcus's family during what I'm going to call action banter. The banter you get during actual gameplay outside of cutscenes. We know that Marcus's dad thought he could prevent the war. Dom references knowing his father and Marcus holds some semblance of disdain towards his father. Which we learn through digging deeper that his dad was kind of a martyr. A guy who thought he could end all of this himself. A guy who thought he knew how to hold back the Locust Horde. Once in control, you head back into a small settlement. Wretches attack from all sides. It's kind of scary. But it's actually here where during my first playthrough I noticed something. That the game is well designed enough for you to use squad mates as compasses to avoid having a mini map or a HUD or an arrow pointing you in every direction. I really like this because it's immersive. Usually your squad mates will stand facing the direction you need to head in the area you need to head to. And you can locate them at all times by holding Y. Here doing so points me directly towards this area and then the way he's facing points me directly towards this door. Smart compromise. But now it's time to distract the Brumac to keep it away from the power lines. But once again, this fight is a non-starter. You make your way away from the power lines as the Brumac hunts you through cutscenes. Until you reach a settlement in which he's literally just above you as you make your way through a bunch of wretches. 
Little environmental touches here, like a movie theater showing a film called They Came From Below, is nice, but finally, it's time to fend off the Brumac as you make your way underneath that theater. He is marching directly towards you down the street in one of the best set pieces in the game. It looks like you're facing down Godzilla by yourself. In reality, all you really need to do is slow him down by shooting the legs and eventually you're off while the Brumac survives. The goal to take down some cedars. In the first and maybe only genuinely great moment of splitting up Marcus, you make your way to the stage of the theater. If you head to the balconies, you're above, taking out a few grubs, but more importantly, you're tasked with taking down the stage to cover the cedar. Shoot these four clamps and boom, you're good to go. Out into the parking garage, you can still hear the broom hack above you, and you'll finally kill a cedar without the hammer by blowing up a truck and gas tanks with the turrets, before finally getting to Tim Gad Central Energy. Delta needs something big enough to connect two Transformers. That's going to be the Brumac. This is the fight you've been waiting for. It's a fight in a relatively open field with gates surrounding it, and you finally get a good glimpse of the Grub commanding the Brumac on top of it. It's a great fight. Once again, no QTEs, all in action, all skill. You take out the arm guns while avoiding fire as he pushes up on you and towards you at all times. Then, the goal is, once both arm cannons are down, is to take out the legs to get him down to his knees so you can have him bend over and kill the grub commanding him. It is great spectacle and fun to boot. But as always, with Gear's depressing tone, the good guys, even after taking out the Brumac, have lost control of the train. So Delta has to catch it as it passes the station. Only Dom and Marcus make it onto the train after a battle at the station, and you've now reached the final sequence of Gears of War. The train is pretty great. If you've seen Snowpiercer, it's kind of like that, except more awesome and carnage-like. Simply push forward through cover, design, therons, grubs in your way, and eventually some wretches. But if you pay attention, the train is running through the terrain of Sarah. And if you look around, you can see just how dark the world has gotten. Black clouds, orange skies, float over green hills and bright trees. It's sad. A juxtaposition clearly designed so that you know underneath all of this darkness was a world worth living in. Eventually being almost unbelievable, the epic managed to get a berserker onto the train. This one's a lot easier to You lure it onto the platform with a big giant red tank and blow the tank on the platform which sends the berserker and the actual train platform itself out into the wild. And then you're headed to the battle station. It introduces the readers which have two people riding on the back of them. And they're quite annoying, but it's pretty cool being able to shoot them from within the train, through windows, or even atop the train to change them. And then you see them. In maybe the second coolest scene in the entire game, General Ram, at the front of the train, surrounded by Krill, in what is an awesome scene. Cole takes some of the Krill out from above with the UV turret from a heli, which I think might be a small cutscene, or a portion of that cutscene, designed to remind you, the player, this late into the game, that yes, stay in the light, that's what the Krill want to avoid. And that's important, because the Krill Ram will send it to you in this final fight. See these tiny lights on the bottom of the train platform? Yep, these are the things you need to stand on to avoid. Killing Ram is a massive challenge. Maybe your program will make your better than me, but for me, on both of them, your best bet is to take the torch bow in the room for this, and use it to hit him somewhere on his body. This explosion will spread the Krill that are protecting them, Bring you up to go on. Uh, meanwhile, you must stay in the lights of the floor, or else the grill will finish you in seconds. I love everything about this fight, but mostly it's, it's, it's going to be, at least for me, and for many others, the most difficult boss fight you're gonna face in the first place. And it's fitting. General Ram is full of hell. He is a massive monster to take down, and he is threat. I'm not gonna go for too long, he is taking you out in half of this. A lot of games build up these villains, build up these final showdowns, and then from a gameplay perspective, they don't really live up to that. General Ram, at least in my opinion, is not one of those fighters. Eventually, you'll finish Ram and end up on a chopper, watching the bomb go off in the lake of emulsion. At the end of the game, you're met with this cutscene. They do not understand. They do not know why we wage this war. Why we cannot stop will not stop. Why we will fight and fight and fight until we win or we die. And we are not dead yet. As per the modus operandi of Gears of War, as you can see, all hope and happiness is undermined immediately. The scene heavily insinuates, as what appears to be 
the Locust Queen says that they will keep fighting. We are not dead yet, she says, setting up the sequel. The first Years of War is a marvel from almost every perspective. It's hard to put yourself in the shoes of someone playing this game around release, but if you can for just a second, think about how much Gears of War got right in a time where so many games weren't doing these things anywhere near as well as this. Yes, the game does have some problems. The darkness does get fatiguing, the undermining of hope does as well, but that's also one of the game's strengths. It just kind of depends on the mood you're playing it in. Sure, some of the cutscenes are wonderful, and there are quite a few bugs and glitches on the original version of the game, as well as the Ultimate Edition, which has its own problems. And I do think that this game was kind of the prototype for what Gears could be. Enemy design is lacking. I don't want to have to kill 300 wretches. That was far too many sequences that they defined. I think by the end of this, what's 8, 9, 10 hours of an experience, you start to grow tired of seeing the same enemies over and over and over again, and the excitement you see of two brutes going through a door isn't nearly the excitement you shared about, I don't know, 3 or 4 hours before that. And Gears' story isn't wonderful. It's okay, a lot of its story is implied, and a part of this is due to the fact that the team was so short on time to do the cinematics. But it is quite shallow. It's obviously expanded upon and gets much deeper with future entries and tie-in comics, but for what's just offered in the game, it's not nearly as deep as it could be. Even the characters are kind of one-note characters for the most part outside of maybe Marcus. But that's okay, because what Gears 1 is focused on is gameplay, and that's what Gears 1 nails. So yes, I think even with its flaws, Gears 1 is worth remembering. Look, Gears of War is kind of an anomaly. On the surface, it appears to be something as generic as something could possibly be. Gruff military shooter with gruff military protagonists in dank military environments. On paper, it isn't exactly a revelatory elevator pitch. And yet, it goes to substantiate a principle that should be clear as day. There is nothing that matters more than execution. You could have the greatest gameplay innovation, the best narrative, the most unique environments, but if you can't put all of that together, they all become marketing jargon. Sometimes it's better to take what works and make it better. Gears of War not only holds up over a full decade later, but it's a genuine foundation for something that for the most part, for the most part, only gets better. And we'll talk about that in future videos. There isn't a third person shooter on the market today that wasn't in some way inspired by what the first Gears of War accomplished. You see an almost identical active reload mechanic in multiplayer games today like Battlefront 2. But I think that Gears 1's biggest accomplishment is that it stands on its own as a true behemoth of entertainment. It isn't just one pretty good piece of a grander puzzle, it, like Bioshock or Arkham Asylum, stand on their own two feet, years after their sequels have hit the market. Next up, well, that is a different story. As I finish this piece, Gears of War 2 already in my sights. I'm excited to see if that game can keep the same relevancy as this one. I'll let you know soon in the next breakdown video, but for now, Gears of War Ultimate Edition is never not on sale. Plates. It is worth it. Well guys, that is it for today's deep dive into Gears of War. As always, it's sort of a dialogue. What do you think of the Gears franchise? Which game do you think is the best? Which game do you think is the worst? And more importantly, if you had to pinpoint one thing that you love the most about Gears 1, that you think was the most influential, that you think separated the game, that one game, from everything else on the market, what would that thing be? And did you even like the game? Remember the answer to all those questions down in the comments below. It's a real conversation. As always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you are not yet subscribed, Press subscribe. I put out long form analysis, short form analysis as many times a week as I possibly can. So hit subscribe so you don't miss any of those. Uh, quick update for you guys and for those of you that are probably already immediately wondering. Uh, as I just alluded to, yes, I will be doing another analysis just like this one on Gears 2, Gears 3, Gears 4, Judgment, and then eventually, as we get closer to it, 5. Um, they will be split up at intervals that make the most sense for me. Um, I don't think the next video is going to be Gears 2. I think there'll be a video or two in between there. Um, but I think we should have all five out well before Judgment launch, or not Judgment, five launches. Um, so yeah, hit subscribe if you're interested in all of those. Uh, also, do want to point something out real quick. It's just really quick. I mentioned this before, going through another move. Uh, so if the upload schedule is a little bit hectic, I try to go Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, uh, but these longer form videos take a lot longer to make and a lot more time. So just bear with me. 
Um, and as always, if you didn't enjoy this video, I'm sorry. I put out more and more content like this each and every week. Maybe you'll catch one of those. But if not, thank you for giving me and this channel a shot. If you want to see more long-form content, right now I have one out on Battlefront 2 and uh, Force Unleashed 1 and Force Unleashed 2. You can check those out. And until next time, guys, I'm out.